start. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, uh, the special ICTS Madhava lecture series. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, and I am very happy to see a lot of uh, new faces here. So I'd like to thank the MLA College for uh, uh, for arranging uh, to have all of you come and attend this. Uh, what I'm sure will be a very fascinating lecture. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the Madhava lecture series is something that ICTS started uh, actually pre-pandemic, uh, and it is. Uh, meant to be um, a set of um, lectures uh, delivered by a distinguished academic on aspects of science, technology, very broadly uh, interpreted and its history uh, uh, in the Indian context, but perhaps uh, more broadly as well. Uh, the first lecture in this series was uh, uh, delivered by Professor Divakaran, who has uh, written uh, formally from the Tata Institute of uh, Fundamental Research in Mumbai, who has written a very nice book on the history of Indian mathematics. And uh, his uh, uh, talk here was very appropriately on Madhava himself uh, from the Kerala School of Mathematics. And we are indeed in the Madhava lecture hall. And actually, uh, probably Sam will tell you a little bit about Madhava uh, himself, uh, in addition to uh, introducing the speaker. Uh, so uh, uh, so in any case, uh, welcome to ICTS. Hope you will also come for many of our other outreach activities. Ha have many of you come before for any of our public lectures or anything? Uh, yeah, a few of you, maybe. Okay, so we have a lot of uh, public talks and lectures, and I hope uh, our outreach team will be in touch with uh, your administration. And uh, there are a number of uh, very exciting talks here, so I hope to see many of you here. Uh, so let me now... Uh, let me welcome again uh, Professor Srinivasan to ICTS, and um, I'm looking forward to your lecture and the ones uh, later, but I'll uh, hand it over to Sam to properly introduce you to the audience and to say a few words about Madhava himself. Thank you, Rajesh. So I'd like to say a few words about uh, Madhava and then introduce the speaker. Uh, Madhava of Sangamagrama is considered the founder of the Kerala School of Mathematics, and he was a pioneering figure in mathematics during the 14th century in Kerala. He's often regarded as one of the most important mathematicians of medieval India, known for his significant contributions to the fields of calculus, infinite series, and trigonometry. Madhava's most Notable achievement lies in its development of infinite series expansions of trigonometric functions like the sine, the cosine, and the arctangent. His work on these series came centuries before similar work in Europe and laid the foundations of modern calculus. One of his most famous series is known as the Madhava Leibniz series, which represents the arctangent function as an infinite sum. He also made important strides in understanding the concept of differentiation and integration. That was something that was discovered much later in Europe, and there's a controversy between Newton and Leibniz over that. His methods involve geometric interpretations and intuitive reasoning, and reflect a deep understanding of calculus long before their formalization by European mathematicians. The Madhava lectures are delivered by eminent scholars on the history of mathematics, science, and technology, which brings me to our speaker today, Professor Sharda Srinivasan from the National Institute of Advanced Studies he is a distinguished scholar in the field of archaeometallurgy. As we know, the history of civilization is closely tied to the history of metals, so much so that historical epochs are often named after the metals that dominated them. Sharda is a prominent archaeologist and metallurgist known for her groundbreaking work in the study of ancient Indian met metallurgy and culture. She has dedicated a career to unraveling the mysteries of ancient metalworking techniques and their cultural significance. Her research encompasses a wide range of topics, including the analysis of metal artifacts from archeological sites, the reconstruction of ancient metallurgical processes, 
and kilns. Her interdisciplinary approach combines archaeology, history, chemistry, and material science. And the cultural exchanges between ancient civilizations. The Damascus sword, which was famous during the Crusades, was made from wood steel, which was imported from India. So in addition to a scholarly and diverse, Sharda is actively involved in promoting heritage conservation and public engagement with archeology. span She has collaborated with museums, educational institutions, and government agencies to raise awareness about the cultural significance of metal artifacts and the importance of preserving archeological sites. Her work has earned her, earned her international acclaim and numerous awards, including the Padma Shri. Now, Sharada's interests comfortably straddle two cultures. She's as much, as much at home in the arts and humanities as in the sciences. In her undergraduate days in IIT Bombay, she was part of a team that made a film that made it to Cannes Film Festival and won an award there. She's also an acclaimed exponent of the art of Bharatanatyam dance. And I look forward to hearing from Sharda. It's all yours. Good day to you all. Am I audible? I'm very grateful to be giving this prestigious set of lectures under the Madhava series of the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, Bangalore. Um, this great scientific institution also affiliated to TIFR, which I also, in a way, grew up with in my earlier years in Bombay. And I'm very grateful for this warm welcome to Director Rajesh, Dr. Rajesh Gopukumar, uh, Dr. Sam and Suparna, who've been in touch with me for some time. And, also, Dr. Spenta Vadia, whom, of course, we have been interacting in various conferences on related topics to do with science and society. So it's a great pleasure to be here. And in this uh, slide, and also it's very good to be here amongst all these very enthusiastic students from uh, lo local colleges. Thank you for coming. So you're looking here at this fine 10th century Chola bronze of the Tamil Shaiva saint Manikavachakar. And he holds a palm leaf, oops, sorry. I just need to get sorted out with, I've gone ahead now. Ah, okay. So this is the point here. So you're looking here at the 10th century Chola bronze of the Tamil Shaiva Saint Manika Vachakar, and he holds a palm leaf manuscript or ole. And I thought that this image, of course, fitted in with the spirit of inquiry and wisdom that we associate with um, a figure like the Indian mathematician Madhava from the Kerala school. And my topic for the next three lectures pertains to exploring the assaying of the eight metals of antiquity through archaeometallurgical perspectives on Indian heritage. And of course, I'll explain as I go along. And the discipline that I draw from is largely described as archaeometallurgy. It is an interdisciplinary branch which is concerned with the applications of scientific investigations in the study of art history, archaeology, anthropology, and craft traditions. And with respect to archaeometallurgy, of course, we look mainly at metallic heritage. And early society's fascination for metals and materials stemmed out of a demand for the production of artifacts ranging from the utilitarian, such as weapons and tools needed for survival and to improve the quality of life, to those which were decorative or had ritual and symbolic functions. And you are looking at the best known example of that, the iconic a uh, golden mask of the Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun, dated to uh, 1330, uh, 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 around 1300 BC, which was discovered in the Valley of Kings by Howard Carter in 1922 and now in the Cairo Museum. And already you can see the skills and uh, exploitation of a range of materials. It's gold repousse with semi-precious stones and lapis lazuli, turquoise and bitumen and so on. So, of course, this was largely a symbolic artifact. So some of the most spectacular artifacts in antiquity were of a symbolic and not necessarily utilitarian uh, purpose. 
And the usage of metals goes back to early prehistory and the trajectory of the eventual extraction and production of metals and alloys has contributed greatly to laying the foundations of science and technology. So we can say that while modern metallurgy has seen an exponential um, growth since the industrial revolution, it is interesting that several of the important innovations have their seeds in ancient practices, which is why it is important to understand the history of technology as it were. Now, to talk about uh, some of the leading contributors to the discipline of archaeometallurgy, um, Cyril Sa Stanley Smith, who was a British-born American scientist who was also involved with the Manhattan Project, and of course that has been in the news a lot recently with the film Oppenheimer, and he was involved in the early development of the metallurgy of uranium and plutonium. And then he moved to MIT in the 60s to work on the history of technology. And his book, The Search for Structure, which explores how the microstructural study of metal artifacts can throw light on the manufacturing processes and the history of technology, is a major contribution in terms of the field of archaeometallurgy, as it were. And another leading figure was Ronnie Tylecote, and they both died in the early 90s. And he wrote of the extractive metallurgy of the key metals of antiquity in works such as Metallurgy in Archaeology, which is also one of the foundational works in the discipline. And he founded the Historical Metallurgy Group. And incidentally, Ronnie Tylecote was also involved with the Institute of Archaeology in London, where I studied and did my doctoral studies. Now, as to why I call this talk the assaying of the eight metals in antiquity, um, of course, in the pre-industrial period, only about uh, two handfuls of metals were known and used in the metallic form. And it's really after the Industrial Revolution, of course, that metals and materials of various kinds have been used, and it's almost exponential. And the periodic table itself has over about 100 elements. But why I call it assaying the metals of antiquity is because the term fire assay refers to the techniques of testing the grade and purity of metals such as gold using pyrometallurgical techniques and in this and probably following in the footsteps of the writings of smith where he terms um, he looks at these aspects in more metaphoric terms as well and the term assay is used in a metaphoric sense where the civiliz civilizational march of humanity and humankind is assayed or tested by the kinds of metals and the metallurgical practices that were used in different times. And I would say that in this uh, march of civilization, there are also many important contributions that have been made from the Indian subcontinent. And uh, we covered some of these aspects and the eight metals in antiquity also in the book that I wrote with Professor S. Ranganathan, uh, of the Indian Institute of Science. Now, the common metals in antiquity included gold, copper, silver, iron, tin, lead, zinc, and mercury. And in general, most of the other elements were widely isolated only after the Industrial Revolution. And metals were extracted and utilized in the past in stages processing from the use of the native metal of which the best known example, of course, is gold, to those metals which could be extracted and smelted more easily, to those which were more difficult to smelt. And as mentioned also by Dr. Sam, the Danish curator of museums, C.J. Thompson in 1836, thus proposed a chronological sequence based on the technological development from the Stone Age, the Copper Age, and the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. So as we shall see, it's not necessarily always such a linear progression. For instance, the Incas and the Mesoamericans, they had spectacular achievements in gold metallurgy and all, which I will talk about more in tomorrow's lectures, but they never actually went into the Iron Age. They never actually produced any iron. So this lecture, as I said, touches upon the Indian subcontinent and also some contributions from Karnataka. Now, native copper is also a soft metal. Copper is also found in the native state apart from as the ores. And native copper was abundantly available in the Great Lakes region in North America and was used to make weapons and implements solely by hammering. So they never went into the processes of more complex process of casting and so on. And you're looking here at some of the mines in the Timna region in the Levant, which shows extensive evidence of mining for copper since the fifth millennium BC. Now, just to give you a sense of my own trajectory into this field, 
Um, I had done an undergraduate degree in engineering physics in IIT actually, and uh, but I was also a classical Bharatanatyam dancer, so I had these conflicting interests, and I wanted to apply scientific analysis in the study of art and archaeology. And I got very interested in studying the celebrated Nataraja bronzes, which also inspire us in our uh, repertoire, in the dance repertoire of Bharatanatyam, which is dedicated to a lot of devotional hymns to the Hindu god Shiva as Lord of Dance, the Shiva Nataraja icon. And the most spectacular example of that, as you see, is from the Chola period in the Chennai Museum. And Ananda Kumaraswamy, uh, who was in fact himself a geologist turned art historian, and again, a person with a, a lot of, uh, you know, these kind of Renaissance interests in art and science, he famously described the image as poetry, but nonetheless science. So I, my thesis was, uh, was to really analyze the South Indian bronzes. And I'll tell you, talk about that in more detail in the second lecture to also look at the implications of the analysis of these metal icons in terms of understanding better the stylistic classification, because there are problems quite often in dating metal artifacts when they're not inscribed and such like. And uh, the techniques that are used uh, involved what we call spectrochemical analysis, in particular, inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectroscopy. And that was found to be a leaded bronze of 8% tin and 8% lead. And I'll talk more about that in the next lecture. But typically these images are made by what we describe as the lost wax casting process. And you're looking at one of the foundries here in Swami Malay in Tamil Nadu. And uh, where in fact the casting is being done and then the final finishing of the Nataraja image. And it's also interesting that the image itself combines certain functional and aesthetic aspects in that the design of the image with the aureole of fire, the Prabhavali, and of course the figure is shown uh, with uh, these uh, pairs of hands, one of which holds the drum associated with Srishti or creation, and the other hand holds uh, the fire or samhara associated with destruction, seemingly balancing forces of creation and destruction. But also the technical um, uh, uh, design is such that it enables more efficient runnering or spread of the metal to be cast because metal, molten metal is quite viscous and for it to flow smoothly, that is why you need the runnering design. And of course, I talked about native copper, but copper, as you saw, is actually quite soft. And that's why tin has to be added to hardened copper. And then just having tin bronze alone is not so uh, helpful for a good casting because the addition of lead, which is a soft metal, actually enables uh, it to be cast better because it uh, 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 lowers the freezing point and so on. And this process, the age-old process of lost wax casting is also described in some of the uh, texts such as the 12th century Chalukyan King Someshwara, who talks about Madhu Chehiste Vidhana, the lost wax casting technique. And as you see here in uh, Swami Malai, first, uh, the model is made of wax, and you can also see those runners in that wax model. Then it's covered with num numerous layers of clay to form the mold. And then the mold is heated and the wax is expelled. And the molten metal is poured in, which you saw in the earlier slide after the deheating. And then you see also the stapati or the craftsperson here uh, cutting off those metal runners, which are now um, extraneous to the image before he does the final finishing. And it's also interesting that there is a, because we're talking about Madhava and writers and thinkers, it's interesting that the Bhakti Tamil poetess Andal, she does use the casting process in a more metaphoric sense in one of her Tamil verses, and she says, which means that she's actually referring to a parallel between the lost wax casting process and the metaphor of the rain clouds. She's comparing the mold with the rain clouds and beseeching the rain clouds to expel the wax um, uh, you know, out of the heart and, and, and to expel the rain in the same way that the mold releases the wax and to rain down on uh, Venkatam, which is the, her Lord Vishnu, who she uh, admires and adores and so on. And it's also interesting, speaking of women, and as you can see, I'm also interested in the dimension of the role of women in, in, uh, in the whole process of 
art, their representation, and the you know the, the, the role that they may have played. And this is a celebrated uh, bronze, which has been um, suggested by Ananda Kumaraswamy to be a portrait of the 10th century Chola queen, Sembian Mahadevi. Of course, we don't have a very uh, sure evidence, but there is an inscription uh, from the Chola period, which suggests that she was actually deified um, and, uh, you know, she was taken around uh, in procession as a processional bronze like other uh, deities. And she was a great patron of temples and bronzes. And there is an inscription in the temple of Aditare, which is one of the temples that she built in the 10th century, which mentions the artisan community, which included the bronze workers of the Kamalar. And in fact, there is a town even today in Tamil Nadu, which is called Semyan Mahadevi and named after her with a very important temple that she dedicated uh, the Kailasanatha Swami temple. And of course, um, you know, Kumaraswamy in his writings, uh, he was the one that suggested that the Shaiva Siddhanta text talks about the balancing of Srishti and creation. And, as he, uh, and to him, as it, it suggested, you know, uh, to, it appealed to his scientific imagination, so, so to speak. And then this image has also been um, more widely since then known as the cosmic dance of Shiva. And we even had writings of Carl Sagan, again, inspired by uh, the writings of Ananda Kumar Swami to some extent. And he talks about how it seems to convey, uh, as he puts it, a, uh, a, a prescience of, uh, you know, modern astronomical ideas and so on. Just the sense of balancing maybe forces of creation and destruction. But it's interesting when you actually look at the verses of Manika Vachikar and so on, there is that some sense of maybe this, uh, this interplay of form and formlessness, because he says, Adi Anantam, Adi Antam Illadavar, the one who is without the beginning and the end and so on. So it is interesting to note that this image is worshipped in the temple of Chidambaram in Tillai. And there in the sanctum in uh, Chidambaram, the Natraj is worshipped in the form both as the Akasa Lingam, which is the element sky, and the anthropomorphic form. And it was also interesting that there is a festival in the month of December, in the month of Margari, known as Arudra Darshanam, where the star Betelgeuse in the Orion constellation, or Arudra, is connected to the worship of Nataraja. And in fact, if you go to Chidambaram and look up at the night sky, you see that Orion appears very prominently right up in the zenith. And so we had undertaken a collaboration with the late astrophysicist, Dr. Nirupama Raghavan. And we found that it's possible that the stars positions of the, ally, of the Orion constellation could have been seen to align along the wireframe of the image, suggesting the inspiration for the iconographic depiction of the Nataraja bronze, where you have that leg which is prominently lifted and the belt of Orion aligning along his waist, so to speak, and the star uh, beetle is falling on the right shoulder. And the leg which is extended, you see that it also seems to uh, be pointed towards the star Sirius, which is also known as Brigavada in uh, the uh, traditional literature and so on. And there is some more basis for it that's been coming forth also from the interviews with the craftspeople. For instance, the Ganapati Stapati, the late master stone sculptor in Mahabalipuram had mentioned that the Nataraja image must be visualized within six white stars that surround the red star, Tiruvadurai. And there was also um, a drawing of this, uh, uh, in which was uncovered by one of the temple priests, the Dikshita's late Raja Dikshita in Chidambaram, which was printed in, in one of the books in the 20th century. And you see down there also the Orion constellation. Anyway, that was all a bit of a diversion, but uh, I think I just wanted to, I'll come back to the South Indian bronzes more, but now I'm gonna go back to earlier um, uh, prehistory to look at the trajectory of development of metals and so on. And, uh, now, uh, I've got here uh, a timeline to do with some of the developments of metallurgy in the Indian subcontinent. And I'll be taking you through some of these um, uh, uh, phases. The Neolithic, as I was talking about the use of the stone tools, and that's what we uh, still uh, are looking at in the Neolithic. But um, copper starts coming into use in the Neolithic, and I'll point to a very early example from Mehergarh in Pakistan, which is now in Pakistan, but part of the complex, which was the Pre-Harappan uh, uh, complex, which then also gives rise to the uh, Harappan metallurgy coming into the Indus Valley and so on. 
And the Chalcolithic also sees the use of copper tools. And one of the very important examples that has now come to light is Sanauli, which I will discuss actually in the fourth lecture, where I'm talking about iron metallurgy and we're talking more about weapons and so on. And then, of course, the Harappan civilization, the Bronze Age. And now the interesting aspect that I'm going to point to in this lecture is that um, uh, when it comes to South India, uh, we do have, as you will see from the stock, the use of some uh, you know, very interesting bronzes, but there isn't a marked uh, evolutionary phase uh, in terms of use of copper and so on, the way we see in the Northwest. But what is quite interesting is actually we're finding some extremely early dates for iron now in South India from Mailadam Pare, which is in fact now ranking amongst the earliest dates known anywhere for iron of around 2000 BC, and I'll come to that. So it almost seems like a transition directly from the Neolithic into the Iron Age. Anyway, I'll touch upon that. And also, as you'll see in this talk, that uh, one of the trends is this aspect of the hmm, strands, uh, because we do know there is a major hiatus in the post-Harappan period in terms of material culture across the subcontinent. The wealth of material culture that you see in the Harappan period, there is what we describe as a hiatus or a, a kind of um, a, 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 a fall in terms of the uh, uh, quantity of material culture that we see. But there are some tenuous strands that you can see which suggest perhaps some links or migration also from the Harappan Northwest into the South Indian Iron Age, which I'm also coming across. So that will be something which I will, because these are tentative, but anyway, these are also aspects to keep in mind. And of course, the most celebrated and iconic image from the Harappan period is the dancing girl, the miniature dancing girl, which is um, in the, uh, uh, it is uh, a very tiny little miniature figure. And as you can see, it has certain strands which definitely bring to mind uh, some aspects that we uh, can see of indigenous culture in other parts of India. For instance, I was noticing that the side bun that is worn, of course, the Gond women also have that, but also in the Nilgiris, the community of the Kota women, they wear the kokot, which is a side bun, which is very much like what you're seeing depicted there. And you also see these uh, shell bangles being depicted. And if you go even today to uh, Kutch, which has a celebrated Harappan site of Dholavira, you see that the women are still wearing shell bangles going right up to the uh, upper armpits, which is similar to what we see in this uh, tiny figure. And of course, that hand on the hip, if any of you have studied Bharatanatyam, you know that that is a very much part of the Bharatanatyam repertoire, which we still see, you know, uh, coming in from the Sadir dance style, which is associated with the Tanjo courts and so on. And you're looking here also at the, uh, Citadel here in Dholavira, and you can see all these dress stone um, uh, pillar bases and such like. And of course, in Dholavira, you see the use of limestone blocks, whereas earlier in Mohenjo-daro and so on, you were seeing the use of brick. And you also see some copper alloys, uh, uh, copper chisels and tools in Dholavira. So clearly, those could have been used also for working stone. And somewhere in the southern reservoir, we found a fragment of um, some uh, mineralized copper debris, which had about 80% copper, whether it is uh, what we call slag, which is the waste product from mineral processing and metal processing, uh, or uh, just corroded lump, uh, we don't know. But anyway, uh, there is some evidence there of metal processing. And then you also find that in, in Dholavira, uh, there is an analyzed um, and copper alloy fragment, which has what we typically call uh, the composition of low tin bronze. That is um, not a very high content of tin, less than about, say, uh, certainly less than about 10%. And it is also unalloyed with lead here. So this is what we call binary bronze, where it is just a copper tin alloy that's been used. But you also find that this is similar to what was observed for um, the dancing girl and so on, that those were low tin bronzes. And it's also interesting that, since I'm quite uh, intrigued by all these continuing, uh, uh, you know, Facets. This is a famous Indus seal, and you see the uh, very prominent headgear that is worn in this figure in the Indus seal. And uh, as I was saying, these aspects which carry on, particularly in some of the indigenous communities. And here you see um, a bronze figure which is still being made by the Bastar communities. 
Of course, we also think that some of these Bastard bronzes, uh, they started making them again. I don't know if there was such a, a long-standing tradition going on, but certainly they've, when they're making them, they're making them following the kinds of um, headgear and so on that they are actually wearing. And you see here the typical buffalo horn, which is being depicted here. And um, this buffalo horn motif, of course, endures uh, also in other communities. For instance, this is the settlement of the Toda indigenous community in the Nilgiris. And you see that the Bukrania or the buffalo head is very prominently depicted in their huts. And you also see here the surrounding cairns or the stone circles, and I'll come to that topic a bit tomorrow uh, tomorrow as well, because there are a lot of important metal finds associated with these cairns with some of the Britishers like Greeks uh, and Eliots who went into the Nilgiris uh, in the um, early 19th century uncovered. And um, you see here also the Toda buffalo, so you can see the inspiration for those prominent buffalo horns and so on. And here you also see the... Uh, uh, lost wax uh, process being used to make these figurines. And they do remind you, for instance, of the style of the uh, dancing girl. But here in uh, the prominent technique, the dokra, is that they use these thin uh, strands of um, uh, wax, which they actually use as strings. And then they build up the image with those wax strings. And here you can see one of the Bastar artisans actually squeezing the wax out here. And this, I don't know if uh, you, you'll be knowing the uh, some of the traditional, especially South Indian food, foods like the ingurel and all that, that's how they make them. They string out the the, uh, the rice batter and so on and make it. So it's, there's a lot of relation there between cooking and so on. So, uh, of course, I won't be able to cover all the eight elements today, but I'll try and cover uh, uh, some of them and then some of the others would go into the other lectures. Now, coming to gold... Um, the noble metal of gold, of course, is one of the most sought after, and it is soft and ductile as well. And one of the earliest spectacular collections of gold jewelry is from the Varna Cemetery in Bul Bulgaria. And this is, of course, a reconstructed cemetery. But this had some uh, 3,000 gold artifacts. Sorry. And... Uh, uh, in the necropolis, and these had been carbon dated to the 5th millennium BC. And of course, at Mohenjadaro and Harappa, and in the Harappan sites, also like Mandi in Haryana also, we see many of these um, gold headbands and belts, and also this uh, very typical fish motif made by the repousse technique, and I'll also come back to that maybe in tomorrow's lecture when I'm talking about some of the um, Iron Age finds and so on. And um, interestingly, uh, recently, we were also able to do some portable XRF analysis for some golds which had been found associated with the Iron Age urn burial site in Tamil Nadu near the Purunai River. And these have also been generating a lot of interest. Uh, these have been excavated by the Tamil Nadu State Department of Archaeology. And the C14 dates uh, from Paddy, which was sent to a very reliable lab, Beta Analytics in Florida, came to 1125 BC. So this is actually pushing back the Iron Age also in South India. This, and there's a find of a gold foil here from Shivagalai. And uh, so we had done a portable XRF analysis, which is a technique where you can get a surface compositional analysis using the technique of X-ray fluorescence. And the advantage with gold is that it's not corroded, so you can get a very good uh, result. Because if it is a corroded surface, then it's, it's more complicated with XRF analysis. And you can see here that this had about 87% uh, gold, which is actually the composition of 22% uh, carat gold and 8% uh, silver and a little bit of copper. And the addition, of course, of copper to gold would have been also to harden the gold. And this is also in the shape of uh, some kind of broken up um, gold foil. Now, it was quite interesting because I was talking about the Nilgiri material. And uh, these are some of the terracottas which had been um, found by Greeks. And many of these are the British uh, Museum collections now. I mean, there are some problems in the dating of these uh, Nilgiri can material and all that. But it's quite interesting that you do see a figure wearing some kind of... Um, a diadem on the top and that kind of beard. And though it's a very debased kind of figure, I couldn't help being reminded of this bearded priest king with the diadem from Mohenjadaro. And, uh, uh, you know, even amongst the, the Kotas and the Nilgiris, uh, you know, the Kotas were also indigenous communities who were goldsmiths. And you'll also see, of course, the Todas also, they were, wear that shawl on their... Uh, on their, um, you know, uh, on their shoulder. So I don't know, it just these kind of strands though across, you know, time and space, but still it's, it's kind of interesting at least to look at what 
It might say about how some artifacts might have been worn. And these, of course, are the gold headbands that you find from Mohenjo-daro. Now, in Adi Chandalur also, you have found there are a lot of finds of what we call mouthpieces or diadems, uh, which were uh, reported by Alexander Rhea. And several of these are in the Government Museum at Chennai. And uh, that's why what you're seeing with uh, Adi Chanelur and Shivagalai is also some continuity in these finds of gold diadems. And Adi Chanelur also, uh, the gold finds were then AMS dated to about 900 BC. Now, as to the source of gold, it's very interesting that right here in Karnataka, we have some of the earliest known dates for deep hard rock mining for gold anywhere in the world. And uh, in the Hatti Maski region of North Karnataka, you see extensive old gold workings, which consist of open cast and deep mines, which follow the veins of auriferous quartz. And these were some field visits that I'd made back in 92 also with Dr. Prabhakar Sangurmat of the Hatti Maski region. And there are also these Neolithic ash mounds, which have been dated to about 3000 BC at Wandali and so on. And these ash mounds often have these mulakar fragments and pestles, which we believe could have been used to grind the auriferous quartz to separate gold particles. But of course, we do know that these kinds of pestles and so on were used for food processing and so on. But the fact that there's so many are found there are quite interesting. And for instance, the Olchins had speculated that perhaps some of the Harappan gold may have also come from uh, these kinds of Neolithic regions. And the other surprising thing was that the dates that were uh, found for some carbon, uh, which were uh, from timbers, which were collected from about 200 meters depth. Uh, were already dated to about 4th century BC. So that is actually slightly pre-Maurian. So if they had gone so deep already by the pre-Maurian period, it's quite likely that they had, uh, you know, in earlier times, they had been, uh, you know, doing surface prospection and so on. And we also know of the famous rock edict of Ashoka in the Maski region. And this region was also known as Suvarnagiri or the mountain of gold, which might refer to some of the gold obtained from the surrounding uh, areas. Now I'm going to take you back in space and time to, I, I mentioned Mehergad, and uh, the reason why I'm taking you there is because there's a very interesting find that you're looking at here, this tiny amulet, which is in the shape of a six-poke wheel. And this goes back to about three, 6,000 BC, and this site was excavated by the French team of Jarij and also um, uh, Benoit Mille from the Louvre Laboratory, who had studied it using luminance techniques. And they suggest that this is uh, already a lost wax casting and a very early example of lost wax casting. Um, and also, it's interesting that when you look at that Nataraja image, you can see that when they were experimenting, this form was something that was obviously easy to cast because you have, you know, this uh, natural runnering because the metal can flow more easily like this into the uh, into this little amulet. That's of course very tiny. And of course, at uh, Mehergad, you also see the connections with the Neolithic in the Near East the Persian Gulf and Mesopotamia, early evidence of farming. And you see also uh, very prominent depictions of the, of the Zebu bull, the humpback bull and so on. And it's also interesting that the language which is spoken in Baluchistan is Brahui, which is similar to the Dravidian group of languages, um, you know, linked to Kannada and Tamil and so on. So that has also been, um, you know, one of the reasons for suggesting that they may have been uh, a migration um, from those regions carrying some of these motifs and so on. And when you look at uh, Dholavira, this is a gypsum signboard, famous gypsum signboard in Dholavira, which has these Indus signs. And you see the spoked wheel, which is very similar to what we're seeing here at Mehrgarh. So it was actually one of the signs in the Indus language. And another interesting example of the humpback bull has also been unearthed in uh, haryana which also has some important harappan sites this has got banded agate and gold horns and uh, the bull of course is very prominent also in mesopotamia uh, going back to about 2600 bc at any rate and it's also found as i said in pre-harappan pottery and also the peacock and zebu and now coming here to um, a closer home, this is an interesting Neolithic site uh, at Sanganakalu in Karnataka, which is dated to about 3000 BC. And of course, I first got interested in Sanganakalu because it has a lot of these very interesting rock cupules. The uh, this, this stone here is very, it has a very strong tonality, very metallic ring. And these are these handmade cupules. And we think that the uh, people here 
uh, in the Neolithic or whatever, were actually using these uh, stones to make uh, some kind of music, uh, resonant properties, you know, for the musical or resonant properties at any rate, percussive properties. And, and in fact, I have a YouTube link also you could uh, look at sometime to see how it sounds. But here again, you find the zebu bull and the peacock, these kind of uh, motifs going back to the Neolithic. And I've also found uh, the circle with a cross, not with the six spokes, but it might have been some kind of sign that carries over into the Neolithic here also. And another fascinating aspect is that talking about the Iron Age, now here we're talking about an excavation which took place in Oroville by uh, uh, Ravi Perumal, about 500 BC. And here you're seeing uh, this depiction of um, a metal depiction of an urn. I'll, I'll show you the terracotta urns in a minute. These were actually urn burials. And the finial, which has uh, the animals here, and here is a typical zebu bull. And next to it, you have the egrets, the cattle egrets. If you all have gone around in the paddy field, you'll, you'd have seen this, the buffalo with the cattle egret and so on. So, you know, a very charming aspect of the typical uh, rural life unchanged today is also captured there. And again, the significance of this humpback bull uh, right from early prehistory. Now, another type of alloy which was used uh, quite a bit before we come to the prominent use of bronze was actually arsenical bronze. Now, arsenic was never extracted as a metal in antiquity, but it would have been um, a product as an impurity, which was coming because of the ore being used to smelt copper, which was an arsenical ore. And, um, and hence the, but, but the effect that it would have had was that the arsenic would have actually um, hardened the copper. So that's why they actually preferred the arsenical bronze because it was harder. But it's also interesting, it had another property which the Mesopotamians in particular had been able to isolate and uh, use, which is that there's uh, with about 6% of arsenic in, um, in copper, it leads to segregation. The arsenic segregates to the surface and it gives a very silvery color to the surface. And uh, this was actually known by the Mesopotamians and they, some of these arsenic, arsenic bulls, you can see some of the silvery surface, which is due to the arsenic segregation. And we think they were deliberately using arsenic uh, uh, bronze for this purpose. But what is interesting also was that you do find some examples of arsenic copper also in the Harappan repertoire. And then it seems to carry on into the peninsular region also. For instance, this is uh, a bangle from Mahaujari with, with Darba megaliths, which have similarities to the megalithic cultures that I was talking about in Southern India. I showed you some of the cairns uh, surrounding the Toda settlements. I'll come back to that a bit more uh, in tomorrow's talk, but this is uh, dated to about 700 BC. And here you see a different kind of structure. I don't know how much you'll understand about metallography, but basically how you get this kind of structure is you cut out a very, very tiny sample if they allow you, but I was very lucky. This is no more than a millimeter or two millimeters with, with a jeweler saw and you polish it, which is actually very difficult to do. It's much easier to polish large chunks, but very, very difficult actually to polish archeological samples and get meaning out of them. And so here you see actually uh, this particular phase which causes this enrichment, which is the um, um, uh, copper arsenic phase here, which, which you see these little kind of uh, whitish regions around here. And these kinds of bronzes, of course, you don't see them uh, much later. That whole use of arsenic and copper seems to, to, to die out after that period. Um, and now I'm going to uh, talk a bit more about the uh, other kinds of bronzes. And of course, we talked about the Chola bronzes. And uh, from the analysis, which I'll touch upon more tomorrow, many of these are... Uh, as I mentioned, low tin uh, leaded bronzes, and some are brasses, but I'll come to that later. And as I said, they were cast. Now, the interesting thing about the Chola bronzes is that they never actually cross the limit of 15% tin. They never added more than 15% tin in the Chola bronzes. And that's quite sensible in a way because uh, below about 15% tin is the range in which the solid solution, the alpha solid solution of, uh, uh, of, of in, in copper forms. And for instance, here you see the microstructure of a chola bronze. And so you see this very coppery color because this is low tin bronze, not much of uh, uh, copper in it, but please note the color because that's quite significant. And this dendritic structure, which is also related to the cast process. And um, as I said, 
The reason for not using tin beyond 15% is as you keep adding tin to bronze, it actually becomes very brittle. And it's not a very uh, uh, a good material when it gets very brittle. And a prime example of that is here from Thailand, a Buddha image, which now contains 22% tin bronze, but this is as cast. And you can see the hand is completely broken off here because this much of tin actually causes embrittlement of the bronze. And you can see why that happens here. This is an as-cast bronze, uh, and this is the alpha solid solution phase, as I was talking about. And, and in the interdendritic spaces, you can see that uh, this uh, phase has formed the alpha plus delta eutectoid, which is what causes the embrittling. But astonishingly, in South India, it's not as if they didn't know what to do with, uh, with bronze and what happens with higher compositions and how to manipulate. And fascinatingly, they were using a particular composition of bronze at about 23% tin, where if you look what happens, this is a phase diagram which shows you what keeps happening when you keep adding tin to copper, alloying tin to copper at different temperatures. So at 23% tin bronze, you find that at a high temperature of about 650 to 750 degrees, there is a formation of this beta phase. And this beta phase is actually an intermetallic compound of composition Cu5SN and a fixed composition of 22.9% tin. So what happens is that when you have a bronze which optimizes this composition of the beta phase, then if you heat it to very high temperatures, you can actually forge that bronze very extensively. And they seem to have, of course, arrived at that and extensively hot forged this bronze, which is of uh, pure beta bronze, 23% tin bronze. And you can see that from the microstructure here. And after this very heavy uh, degree of hot forging, they've quenched it. And that quenching is very important. Quenching means rapid cooling in water. Because if you rapidly cool from here at this temperature down to 20, you know, down to room temperature, you can see that that beta phase retains. Otherwise, it won't retain and you get all these other phases. And that's what happens here. They've, so you can look at the structure and tell how it was made, that this is a quenched, rotten quenched beta bronze. And it's amazing that this was already in vogue in the uh, South Indian Iron Age. And I was also able to find uh, some traditions where they're still working uh, heightened bronzes in exactly the same way. This was in Palakkad in Kerala. So it shows you here how first the ingot or cast ingot of 23% beta bronze is being annealed here. And in fact, in those days, they were using these buffalo bag bellows, which are no more used, I guess. They've gone to modern bellows and so on. And then it is hot forged on the stone anvil in repeated cycles of uh, annealing, hot forging, annealing, hot forging. And then finally, that step of quenching is very important that uh, again, heating it to high temperatures so the beta phase forms and then quenching, because only then you retain that martensitic beta phase. And one reason why that alloy was also preferred is because when it's polished, it also looks very bright and golden, just like um, uh, gold and that kind of thing. So in a way, there are these strands of what we might describe as living prehistory as uh, D.D. Kosambi also comments on. Now, it's quite interesting because these are actually some of the earliest examples of using such bronze inter intermetallic compounds. I have now come to uh, uh, that understanding from further analysis, uh, not only in the Indian sub subcontinent, but I think also elsewhere in the world, because now we are finding dates, as I'll show in the next few slides, for Adi Chinlur taking back to the late second millennium BC. And also these kinds of extremely highly wrought vessels. I mean, the rim thickness here is no more than 0.1 to 0 0.2 millimeters thick. And to have done this by hand is simply astonishing. And plus the strainer has these very, very, very tiny perforations. And you see here this quench beta bronze structure. And just to confirm that the metallurgy of what was being done in that workshop is exactly the same as what was going on here in the Iron Age. This is a vessel from uh, uh, that same workshop where the inside has been now polished and scraped and so on. And it had the exact same structure of uh, rotten quench beta bronze and same composition as well of 23% uh, tin, uh, tin bronze. And these are binary bronzes because they don't have any lead added. And that's also an important aspect because um, uh, it, they are a class of alloys which seem to be uh, going for, I mean, isolating the intermetallic compound phase. Now, this is the urn burial site in Adi Chilur, And you were looking at this metal uh, uh, examples of an urn uh, burial, uh, you know, similar to the terracotta urn burials, where you have the bottom, which is of metal, and then a finial with the animals and so on. 
And of course, when Alexander Ray found some of these, and there's also the, again, the famous Buffalo motif, which I was telling you about, which you see in many examples in, in the prehistory. When Alexander Ray uncovered these in the 19th century, they were uh, excavated a bit haphazardly. So we couldn't actually get uh, proper C14 dates and so on. But now there have been these systematic excavations uh, the last few seasons um, at Adi Chinlur, which is near this Porunai River, as you see. And these are, these are some of the actual terracotta urn burials. And they actually had skeletons and so on inside of these uh, burials. And as I said, the dates also for Adi Chinlur go back to 13th century BC, including for the finds of, of bronze. And uh, we took our portable XRF machine, and this is one of the pet, pit burials here in Adi Chinur, and went down it. And um, in Shivagalai also, we found the use of uh, this beta bronze composition. And um, in Adi Chinur, we also found a fragment which had more tin than copper, 53% tin. So uh, clearly, by the end of the second millennium, there was the use of heightened bronze already in South India. It's a topic I'll come back to tomorrow because it again raises a lot of other questions, but we won't handle it all here. Another very interesting type of alloy which used uh, heightened content was used to make metal mirrors. And this is a metal mirror which is still being made in Aranmula and Kerala. And this is of uh, specular bronze of about 32% uh, tin. And I'll discuss it in tomorrow's lecture why the use of this 32% tin bronze was made. Because, in fact, this is exactly what causes the embrittling in the uh, bronze, if you keep adding it, the delta phase. But the delta phase is also very shiny. It gives a, it's very reflective. It gives a very good uh, reflectance for a, a, a mirror uh, and it takes a lot of polish. And that is also something which they had discovered. And even in the Nilgiri Cairns, you actually find a sample which Breeks had analyzed, and now that's in the British Museum. And he mentioned that that had about 30% in, which was analyzed those days using um, certain other uh, bulk ch chemical analysis techniques. So it would be good to go back and see that to see exactly what the composition is. But just to also point out that you do have these uh, usage of uh, mirrors in Indian antiquity. And also the Nilgiri Cairns, the fact that they had a mirror, they also have some very beautiful gold ornaments, which are also amongst the earliest finds of gold ornaments from the Indian subcontinent, because, you know, metals actually get remelted all the time, and especially gold. So you often don't find many of the riches from the Indian subcontinent, which were there in the past, because they went, uh, they were either hoarded, or they went, uh, you know, down as heirlooms. So we do have wonderful, spectacular sculptures, you can see where you can just imagine what sort of ornaments they were wearing, but you have no evidence because a lot was melted down. But because they were hoarding, and there were burials in the Nilgiri, some examples have actually has uh, been saved of very early gold, and I'll revert to that topic tomorrow. Now, I'm just going to very briefly talk about two more uh, uh, traditions in terms of uh, what they've contributed to the history of metallurgy, and I will revert also to these in our future lectures. I'll just take another, I don't know how long I've been talking, another five or ten minutes, is that all right? Uh, yeah. So, um, we have two remarkable stories of transfer of technology from the East to West, from India to Europe, and the semi-industrial production of which were forerunners in, uh, of the Industrial Revolution to some extent. One is the zinc smelting, and the other is the making of high carbon wood steel. And now William Champion is credited with zinc production in Bristol in 1736. But ev evidence suggests that it was inspired by the Zawar process of zinc smelting. So at Zawar, there was a process of downward distillation of the zinc vapor, uh, which was formed from smelting zinc coal. Now, zinc actually came into vogue in antiquity quite late um, because of the fact that it is uh, it tends to sublimate by the time you smelt it. Uh, you know, when you smelt it, it, it doesn't, it's not easy to kind of collect it in the liquid form. So it tends to sublimate or become gaseous. So I'll discuss that tomorrow, the procedures of how they actually manage to uh, collect the zinc vapor and isolate it. And this is also a view of Zawar. Of course, the Aravalis have a lot of ore and there is a lot of evidence for early uh, copper extraction and metallurgy and so on. And this is our where the zinc mines are. And I'll come back to that tomorrow. And some of the scholars who worked also on the uh, zinc production were Paul Craddock at the British Museum, who worked a lot with Hindustan Zinc. And also, I'm here with Dr. Karakwal and others. And the ASM landmark was also awarded to the Zawar zinc metal process because it's quite unique. 
And we also have an interesting innovation uh, in North Karnataka under the Bahamani Sultans, the innovation of high zinc alloy, Bidri alloy, which you still see, which has actually got um, almost 90% of zinc in it. And again, I'll touch upon that tomorrow, the process of Bidri making. Now, I want to touch upon one technique I've used here because I will touch upon it in the later talks. And also because one of the important things we also do as archaeometallurgists is to try and explore the provenance and so on of artifacts using techniques in geochemistry, which helps to better classify them. And one of the techniques that I used, and you know, going back to my own background in physics and this being ICTP, one of the techniques I used, which I think I was also at that time a little bit inspired by the fact that my father was um, uh, Dr. Amar Srinivasan was a nuclear uh, physicist and he was always talking about fission and fusion and the uranium and thorium cycle. So now we have a very interesting uh, technique here, the lead isotope ratio analysis, which is based on uh, the ore geochemistry and the fact that, you know, in different ore deposits, the composition of uranium and thorium uh, varies based on the geochemistry of the ore deposit. And that's quite useful because of the fact that you get quite a lot of variation in uh, a measurable variation in the lead isotope ratio composition, but it doesn't actually vary from the extracted extracted ore into the artifact because when you're actually smelting metals the elemental composition of course changes but isotopic composition doesn't change so what that technically means is that in a particular lead artifact you should be able to trace the source of the lead by the fact that the, the I mean, and that of course depends on whether the lead source itself has been analyzed and the isotopic ratios have been found but if you have been able to find the lead isotope ratios of a particular ore source it could match with a particular artifact. And we have an interesting example here of Harappan leads from Saran, which I analyzed uh, along with uh, uh, Dr. Tom Fenn. And, it, uh, and these, of course, are some of the South Indian bronzes, which I've analyzed, which I'll talk more about tomorrow. And we do see that uh, uh, Saran does have some match with some early analysis from Western India, Ambadongar, though I don't quite know where that uh, exactly is. So there needs to be some more work done there, but I know it's somewhere in Western India. So, and that seems quite likely also. I mean, it's plausible because this is from uh, Gujarat region. And it's interesting that one of the binary bronzes from Megalithic Kodumanal in Tamil Nadu of 5th century BC, that had lead isotope ratios, which very closely matched uh, some galena that I collected from fieldwork from this old copper mining area in Agni Gundala, which also has lead zinc uh, mines. This is in Andhra Pradesh. And that uh, 5th century BC binary bronze very closely matched Agni Gundala. And you, you can see it uh, up there, over there. So you can actually, if, if you really find, uh, uh, you, you have the isotopic data for the osos, you can find a good match. And why this is also interesting is because it also suggests, because quite often it's suggested that because there was so much of uh, more of copper ore in the north, you know, in the Aravallis and so on, those might well have even been the sources for some of the bronzes we've been talking about. But this suggests that already there was exploitation here of the South Indian mine by this period, this is the Agni Gundala region. And also, uh, Zawar has, uh, of course, you can see here the, the lead isotope ratios for Zawar falling somewhere up there. But it's interesting that when, uh, and the other thing, of course, is that though here we're talking about binary bronze, there's no lead added here. But even a copper will have some trace of the lead deposit. So what you're actually looking at here is the copper traces. And here, um, I was talking about the zinc smelting and, you know, the fact that the downward distillation was a process used to, you know, get the zinc vapor to to uh, the, the process in Zawar used was downward distillation where the smelted zinc vapors cooled down radically to then condense it and get, uh, you know, the zinc ingot. So you can see here almost like a condensate. And these are actually some uh, zinc coin ingots, which had a fourth century uh, Deccan Brahmi inscription. And they're actually from the Deccan. And what is interesting is that these lead isotope ratios did not match Zawar. It's not from Zawar. It's some of the earliest examples of metallic zinc anywhere again, fourth century uh, CE or something. And it's not Zawar. We don't know where it is, and it is fitting some of my uh, artifacts, as I'll show you tomorrow, from the Andhra region in South India of that period. But we don't know the source, but it clearly suggests also that there was some early uh, use of metallic zinc also in South India. So when you do some analysis, you, you get more questions than answers. 
Now, I'll just briefly talk about iron, but I'll talk about iron more in the last lecture. Now, iron also is a difficult element to isolate, and it occurs in the native state only as meteoric iron, which was, of course, exploited by the North American Indians to make weapons and so on. And iron, of course, has a very high melting point of around 1550 degrees centigrade. So in the old world, it was produced by reducing the metal to solid state in the bloomery iron uh, process. And the most celebrated example of early iron that we have is the Delhi iron pillar, which is in fact the largest example of the earliest massive wrought iron forging that there is anywhere in the world. And this also has an inscription of the Gupta period of the fourth century CE. And it's at a height of about uh, seven meters. And you see here this inscription here of the Gupta Brahmi period. And it is a victory monument also to suggested of Vikramaditya Chandra Gupta II around 400 CE, and this is also a Gupta era gold coin. Now, the Delhi Iron Pillar was also the first artifact to have been studied uh, in terms of, uh, you know, understanding metallurgical processes by Robert Hadfield, so Robert Hadfield in 1912. And he went on to, of course, develop manganese steel or Hadfield steel. And we were also involved in getting an ASM landmark for the Delhi Iron Pillar. But there is another tradition which attracted a lot of interest, which is the Woods crucible steel making. And in fact, Benjamin Huntsman is credited with the production of crucible steel in 1740. But this was likely to have been in inspired by the Indian Woods process. And in my last lecture, I'll talk much more about, um, about those aspects. Now, what is this wood steel? So Woods is believed to be a Europeanized version of the term ukku, the word for steel in South Indian languages. And the novelty is that now when I talk about wrought iron, that hardly had any carbon in it. It must have had carbon, which is less than about 0.04%. Um, and so that iron could have been forged. But what happens when the carbon content keeps increasing is that it becomes steel and that makes it harder. And so it was used for weapons and so on. But normally the kinds of steel that we use were what were called mild steels with about 0.04% carbon or so. But what was novel about Woods is that it had a composition of carbon of about 1.5% carbon, which was not much used in the European world. And this, as I will explain later, was um, a process where they were actually carburizing the low carbon wrought iron in crucibles, which were packed with carbonaceous materials so that the carbon got into the wrought iron and you got a high carbon steel of about 1.5% carbon. And the speciality of this particular wood singot was that when it was forged, um, and anyway, I'll go into that later, it also had some other properties such as um, super plasticity, which is high formability at high temperatures. So it could be forged quite extensively. And also when it was etched, you got these alternating patterns of uh, the low carbon perlite and high carbon cementite, which is, form, which is part of the intrinsic structure of 1.5% carbon steel. And these patterns were also quite attractive. And so they were sought after, um, you know, and there was a whole uh, terminology, which is also known as Damask, which is derived from Arabic, which is similar to watered silk. And uh, so they were exported quite heavily also to the Persian world and forged there to make swords in the Arab world and Damascus and so on. And of course, we also find several examples in the armories in India and in the Mughal Rajput, Sikh armories, Mysore, uh, Nizams, Tipu Sultan, Tanjore armory and so on. So that I will talk about much more in my last lecture. But what I want to talk about here, just two slides before I finish, is I come back to this interesting point of the recent finds from Mailad and Parai. Now, it's been generally thought that the that iron, uh, the smelting of iron and so on, uh, you know, it came about with the Hittites and then spread, spread very rapidly from uh, uh, those parts, Anatolia and so on, into uh, other parts of the world, and including at some point diffusing into the Indian subcontinent. But uh, in these excavations in Mailad and Parai, we found some very early carbon dates, which were actually done with beta analytic in Florida. And these yielded um, mid-range calibrated dates of going, uh, going back to 2172 BC. And these are actually the earliest known dates in iron now. And these are some of these trenches. And you also see a prehistoric rock shelter here. And of course, I have to also say that we've been getting more and more of these examples of dates going back a bit in time in from the Indian subcontinent. But quite often because the labs that they were sent to, the being Indian labs, you know, it, it's always it's always better to send it to international laboratories because then you get 
much more, I suppose, uh, standardization and veracity. And this is from Beta Analytics, which is the best uh, radiocarbon lab, AMS dating lab there is. And the fact that this is giving such early dates means that we do have to start taking this seriously. And the fact that we get very early iron. And in a way, because the South Indian Iron Age has so much iron, you know, it, it's not surprising, though, if, if we find earlier dates, I suppose. But what is quite astonishing is that there seems to be a transition mainly from Neolithic to Iron Age. As I said, there's no market copper age, though uh, we do see very early heightened bronzes and all that coming in, whether that is from uh, due to the influence of migrating craftsmen from uh, the northeast and so on, northwest and so on. So these are questions to be looked into more. And since I'm in Karnataka, I'll end with this slide. This is a a megalithic site near Hampi, which many of you may have gone to, Kadibakle. It's near the old capital of Hampi, which is Anegundi. And it's a beautiful location across the river, a little megalithic site. And this had been excavated uh, by uh, University of Chicago, uh, Kathleen Morrison and Carla Sinopoli. And we were also in, involved in looking at the, the finds from Kadibakle. And here, this is again, very well dated context of about 9th to 8th century BC. And here I was already finding uh, high, higher carbon steel of about 0.8% carbon with this perlitic matrix. So you can see this process of uh, working towards using high carbon steel had already started in the megalithic and iron age. And uh, in my later talk, in the last talk, I'll talk about the finds from Kodumalal and so on in Tamil Nadu of the fifth century BC and also from Mailadampara if time permits. So I think I should wind up there. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you all will. Uh, I can't really split these talks really because, uh, you know, some things will reappear in later talks and so on. So I hope when you all sit through all of the three talks, you have a better picture. And uh, all right. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Oh, sorry. Um, I think you should leave it on yes, in case there are some questions. Uh, thank you very much for a very fascinating talk. Uh, I uh, 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 just a few questions as an outsider. Firstly, uh, uh, aluminium was never in the uh, even though India has a lot of bauxite. Uh, I guess aluminium is difficult to extract because I guess it's used electrolytically th these days. Uh, there wasn't any prehistoric way of. Uh, extracting aluminium, is that right? That's, right. Uh, no, is, uh, that's why it doesn't feature it doesn't in feature any of these. Uh, not so. before uh, the production in the, after the industrial. You know, uh, uh, but of course, mica interestingly does find its way into, uh, you know, some of those cans and so on. Um, but again, um, yeah, I haven't, um, we don't have any evidence for. Uh, for uh, yeah, uh, or at least we, have it overtly found it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, the iron that you mentioned at the end. Uh, so, mm -hmm. if I understood right, in the Harappan uh, civilization, there wasn't uh, no, no any iron. trace of iron. Or in the Northwest, in general, even afterwards. Uh, you do uh, get some early dates. I think it is. Um, in, we are getting something from Burzwan in Kashmir, which is, I think, 1800, but we're again not sure. Because one problem, of course, in the Indian context is these are all individual dates, and so they need to be done more systematically. Sometimes you need a whole range of C14 dates before you can, uh, you know, really. And again, so that was, I mean, why Maida Parai can't be ignored is also it's a very reliable lab that's done it, and uh, they've been getting earlier and earlier dates because I think the Tamil Nadu State Department has been consciously sending it out to all these labs because they are quite determined to, you know, uh, to get their veracity established. So, uh, but we don't have, uh, an, not before, uh, not as early as the Harappan period, no, I know, I definitely not. So, it, so that's why you feel that this was, in South India, this was an independent kind of a, uh, uh, perhaps, I mean, uh, I, I don't rule out that, uh, see, I mean, the met metallurgical knowledge Maybe if there was some Harappans coming all the way down, uh, they could have maybe worked alongside whoever were there, whether it was hunter-gatherers or whatever, because it seems like there's almost like some kind of confluence of some kind of traditions. I mean, I don't rule that out. Hmm. But um, so I don't know. I, I don't know what uh, how what we can uh, make of it as of now in the sense that it can't be, I can't tell you um, that it's totally independent either because that, 
again, uh, you know, uh, because, oh, oh. and we do have, of course, in Ahar, the Chalcolithic, I think there is a bit of a mixing of, um, you, you see, because iron can also come in as an impurity with copper smelting. Because even uh, as I'll show you tomorrow in, in Kalyadi, some of the, the, the bronze smelting which went on even, even in, in Karnataka, if it's at a very high temperature and there's some iron ore, then it does come in as an impurity. And that's some of the ways in which, in fact, um, you know, you see iron also in, 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 the, in Anatolia and so on coming in that way. So, uh, but how deliberately it was isolated, we don't know. But so here it seems to have been, and this is not meteoritic iron either, because there's no real evidence of any meteors. So it seems to have been, uh, and I, I show on the last slide, there are some really large swords and so on from Mailadamparai already. So it's quite um, interesting, really. It seems to, something which I, I, may be largely independent, but may have had some influence from, some artisans coming or some metal smiths, we don't know, because um, certainly I think with those finds of gold, I do, it does make me wonder if there wasn't some migration of artisans from, you know, the Northwest or whatever. So, yeah, but. Hey, good evening, ma'am. Your talk was very wonderful. Uh, recently, there was excavation in Kaledi. Yeah. I think they are more advanced in all the metallurgy. And moreover, the government of India has not revealed the report what they have done. It. Uh, two days ago, last week, I think the Madras High Court has asked them to submit the report. If the report comes out, I think we may be more advanced than the, what we have discussed now. Yeah, actually, I'll touch upon Kiridi a bit tomorrow because uh, tomorrow I'm, I'm discuss discussing more of, more of the early historic and, uh, you know, the Hellenistic and such like. And Kiridi, of course, again, we are having some pretty early C14 dates now of 6th century BC, which is certainly pulling back the timeline of the Sangam Tamil literature because uh, you can see that it has some of these paved streets and so on, which you do get, you know, which are described in Tamil Sangh literature. So that is certainly, I think, interesting, and it has raised a lot of the profile and interest. So gold also is found in Kiridi. Hi, excellent talk. <laughs> I, I made two observations, and maybe I wanted to ask your view. So if you look at these statuette you showed from Mohenjo-daro, that uh, lady with the bun on the right side. And if you looked at her facial features, which were not very uh, clear, but they looked very South Indian. Yeah. Uh, and the other observation is that most of these Chola bronzes, which you have shown, all have very sharp pointed noses. These are just observations. Is there some story behind it or something? <laughs> yeah, of course, they are in a very like uh, different spans of time, I suppose. Um, but yeah, of course, the, the, the Chola images did represent some kind of ideal, I suppose, you know, ideal kind of beauty or so on. And, uh, how, you know, what influenced those ideals? And, you know, by this time, of course, these are much later periods we're talking about. And so you have... Uh, uh, you know, the other kinds of influences, um, you know, the Sanskritic influences and so on from, from the North and that kind of thing. And, uh, uh, you know, whether, um, so, so certainly there's certain ideal of beauty, which um, is different, but I, I think you do find those kind of faces also in, in South India now, I'm not saying, uh, but, but I see what, what you mean that the, the, Mohanjitaro dancing girl, yes, is a very uh, much the kind of, uh, you know, like I said, that's why I look, when I look at that Kota lady and all, I see a lot of resonance with some of the, uh, you know, kinds of, uh, or if, if you looked at the gowns and so on, similar attire and all that kind of thing. Yes, so very much that, or, or in Kerala and so on, very typical kind of features. And, you know, the other thing about the heightened bronzes, which I didn't mention here, which is, which I found quite interesting, actually, was because, um, you know, the, the term that they use in that workshop, the workshops in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, they call it uh, Ola Vettu. Vettu is the term they use for a vessel. And uh, now that is different from uh, the, the Sanskritic term because they, later on you do find uh, bronzes of this kind being made 
you know, elsewhere also. Not these kind of very highly forged ones, but, uh, you know, general uh, vessels which, they, which, which were then being given the term Kansa, which is more, you know, the Sanskrit uh, term, which is derived also from Kamsya, which is the term for bronze and so on. And so like in Orissa and all that, they call it Kansa. But here in South India, they only call it, and in Tamil Nadu and Kerala, they only, this, this term Vettu is there. So looking at that term, and in the Chola inscriptions, you do have this term Vettil, you know, in the uh, 10th century inscriptions, Vettil. And it's very interesting that uh, when somebody uh, on this Facebook page, some India-Pakistan heritage Facebook page, posted uh, something which looked very much like a heightened bronze. So I asked this Sindhi person, what does he call, call it? He, he said, Watau. And then I found that in Brahui also it's called Watto. And so, you know, that connection with Brahui, Sindhi, and something in the far south, you know, and this is not the, you know, the Sanskritic root that we would associate with, you know, the, the uh, Indo-European Indo advent of languages and so on. So I think there's much more to be explored there than meets the eye. I mean, the, the fact that there are these connections, you know, between, uh, you know, some of these facets of the Harappan civilization and the far south, I think it definitely needs to be more serious, you know, <laughs> cognition taken of it, though I know it's now become a very kind of loaded topic, but I sort of... Any questions from... Yeah. So I, I remember reading your book and right now it's very cool to be actually <laughs> listening to a lecture from you. Thank you. One of the perspectives that emerged from me today was... Um, the history of metalwork as a technology for maybe procuring a uh, five minute cooking, offering, serving, storing, protecting food. So that sort of complicated what you started with the utilitarian decorative ritual symbolic, because if I'm making a deity, then what I want, if I'm in a rural environment is to secure food consumption. So the history of metalwork in relation to how food was actually made when you talked about the utensils and the crafting. So I wanted to know if you have any additional comments on that or um, rabbit holes that I can explore after this. Yeah, th that's very interesting, you know, because some of us, when we focus so much on metallurgy, I'm, I'm more looking at what <laughs> I understand about the manufacturing process, but all of these aspects, you know, but one thing is for sure that the reason why, you know, th that particular, um, what we call all of it in the South and what's called Kansa, you know, in the North, why that survived this, you know, beta bronze was because um, that intermetallic compound is actually quite non-corrosive. So even, for instance, in Kerala, they'll tell you that they can store certain kinds of food. And as you'll see tomorrow, even the todas, they use that for some of their ritual and they've been kind of holding them. So, uh, of course, and the color and some of these things also, I think, go into what becomes a ritual artifact and has that kind of you know, significance over and above, you know, a, a, an ordinary artifact. I mean, brass, on the other hand, does actually corrode and you do have the formation of verdigris and all that. And it's not so suitable for, let's say, uh, food items. But uh, as you'll see tomorrow, brass actually comes into vogue quite a bit also in the, in the making of astrolabes, uh, you know, which is, of course, much later now, you know, high zinc brass that's now going into... Uh, you know, places like Lahore and so on, they become big astrolabe making, uh, uh, you know, places where some of this metallic zinc may have well been used, but this is much later uh, periods, um, certainly from about 13th, 14th century onwards and so on. So there was obviously some connection between the type of metal and, you know, the kind of the purpose. And that's also what I think we find from the study, because earlier it would have probably been thought that it's quite random because, um, you know, to cast a bronze, you don't need to control it that much. It can have 5% in, it can have 10% in, it can have 3% lead, it can have 10% lead. You know, all those parameters can vary a bit because it'll cast all right. But if they were going after specific functions, and I think this is why the record from, let's say, the mirror making and the, the, the vessel making and all is important. It shows that they did have a sense of choosing, uh, looking at functionality also of the material that they were working at. That also informed their choices and it was not just totally random in terms of trying to do whatever they could with whatever material was available. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to add a comment there. One of the vessels that you showed looked like a colander of perforated vessel. Yes. It looked I like a kitchen implement, just the kind of things that we use to today. Yeah, uh, that's, of course, a good point. Mm -hmm. And also another, uh, I think, uh, Thing that I've read somewhere is, you know, with the Sambrani, the, the, the kind of things which you need some steam going through and things like that. Yeah. But yeah, some kind of 
the calendar, but it, it also, I suppose the reason why we think of the ritual aspect is also when it's made in a very skilled way, then you feel that it might have had some extra significance and maybe there was some added uh, significance of some ritual or whatever. But yes, it, 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 it could very well sure. have been a colander. That seems quite... So uh, there's a question good. that's online. I'm sorry. Maybe, should, yeah. sorry. Maybe finish the online question and... Uh, sir, there's one question from Amitabha. Uh, he asks, can you say something about uh, Ashtadhatu? Yeah. So, um, of course, Ashtadhatu uh, refers to eight metals. And uh, we do come across these textual references to Ashtadhatu, like in the Manasara and so on. And, uh, you know, even the South Indian bronzes, they tend to call them Panchaloha, which is five metals. But... These, I think, refer to more symbolic prescriptions because it's not that easy to make an alloy of eight metals which have all those alloys in high proportions. I mean, even with the panchaloha, I mean, my discussions with the craftspeople, I think it's largely what we call leaded bronze or leaded brass. But apart from those three constituents like, say, copper, tin and lead, um, they sometimes also they will tell you that they add for ritual purposes, like small amounts of gold and silver to make up those fives. But it'll be very, uh, but when you do the actual analysis, you won't see it in, in very large amounts because it'll just be like, in fact, I've also made a Panchaloha icon, you know, with, with this craftsperson where basically a few tola you can give him of gold and silver, which you buy. And at the, at the very end, he will just pour it into the casting, but it won't come into like 2% or 3% or something, which can actually be picked up in the casting. Usually it won't be more than a percent. So it's more like a symbolic thing for, for the sake of Shastra. And likewise of Ashidatu, also you get a, you know you get these reports of several different prescriptions and all that. But I mean, uh, you you do sometimes get alloys of what we call gun metal, which has got lead, tin, uh, you know, copper, uh, even maybe some zinc. I've also uh, tomorrow I'll, there's a there's a uh, uh, there's a, a um, vessel from the Krishna Valley fourth century, which has a, a, all of those four four or five elements. But the traces of all of the rest of the eight, you know, and there's a whole complement of those, uh, the eight elements and so on. But they don't go up to more than a percent or whatever. I've never known of, let's say, a an, an bronze from antiquity, which had uh, eight elements, you know, ranging up to five, ten percent. And that just doesn't happen. So they were mainly all leaded bronzes, leaded brass, the kinds of natural the alloys that you can make. But maybe something's added for ritual proportions. So it's more a Shastrik notion, really. There was a question Support. here. Any more online questions? No. Uh, yeah, I can take one more. Uh, so, South in, uh, so South Indian did not have any copper or bronze age? Um, well, what I'm saying is that, uh, I mean, uh, it, within that matrix of the South Indian Iron Age, we are finding very skilled bronzes. Um, so... And we do actually find some very early, you know, copper artifacts, but it isn't, let's say, there aren't enough of that to, you know, call it. Um, I mean, the, the reason why we just call it Iron Age is because what predominates in that period is iron. So though you are finding, let's say, skilled hidden bronzes, I'm not saying they were not made locally. That's definitely what uh, what is being interpreted from my studies is that you can't rule out that they were making them locally because... I think only in the South Indian Iron Age you find such very highly forged heightened bronzes, which are quite early and you know of that kind. I'll talk a bit more tomorrow with comparisons with elsewhere and so on. So I won't say they're not made locally, but we call it the Iron Age anyway because iron is what predominates in that time. So it isn't. Uh, I mean, there isn't that long-standing evolutionary process like you can see from Merda going from right from six thousand BC into whatever you know, that kind of long process of using copper. We don't see that yet. This is just about this lost wax process. So if you compare what is done in Bastar with this Chola Nataraja, you see that the Chola Nataraja is, uh, has very fine work. So the, how does the process affect the final result? 
Yeah, actually, that is uh, also one of the intriguing aspects about the chola bronzes is the is the, the, the that as you said, very fine expression and detail and so on. Because if you look at the workshops today, of course, they've moved more to, uh, I would say, to brassy alloys. And they do a lot of final polishing and chiseling and all that to get out the features. But if you look at some of the chola pieces, you, you realize that they can't have actually done a lot of final polish, polishing that already in the cast image, that high quality was already there because many of the, 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 the decorations are in relief. They could not have possibly have, you know, uh, kind of carved it in because it's all in relief. So it seems that they were actually able to cast them so skillfully that the, that the that they, they retain that very uh, good quality of the final finish just through the casting process. And for that, that means that they would have had a very good mold, molding technique, the molds that they used. And the fact that they had a very, very fine uh, lining, the inner lining of the mold, which of course the alluvial clay of the Kaveri, they also say plays a big role in all that. It's, 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 in fact, they show you also that you can just put a fingerprint and the fingerprint is retained kind of thing, you know, in that alluvial clay. Because that final layer is very important to get the very finest kind of uh, uh, finish and the adsorption of the gases is also important. So they obviously had figured out very good molding techniques because also the alloy they were using was not brass, it's more bronze. There is some brass, but I find a lot of it was... Was bronze. So they seem to have evolved some very good techniques of, of casting. And also they were doing solid casting, which is not that easy. Because if you look at the, the, the Egyptian and also the Hellenistic tradition, which also influences the North much more, which I'll talk about tomorrow, uh, you know, some very famous examples, such as the Sultan Ganj Buddha, the Gupta period or post-Gupta period. So those are made in the Hellenistic technique of using uh, not solid casting, but they actually have a clay core inside it. And then there's a thin layer of wax. So it's a different way of casting. But for a solid image of that weight, you know, there is also the pressure of metal flowing into the mold and all. So it's actually quite skilled. And where I see the connection also with these, although these are very tiny, but the earlier ones that you see in the Harappan and post-Harappan context, also they are only solid cast. They're not, they don't use the hollow casting process. And that you also see in South India, the preference for the solid casting process. So I'd like to ask a question, if I may. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned this uh, Dravidian language spoken in Balochistan called Drahwe. I was wondering whether, well, Todas also have a Dravidian language and they're a very isolated population. Can one find a DNA link between the Brahui speakers and these people? That would be interesting to pursue. Yeah, I, I must say I've stuck myself to metallurgy, but obviously there is now DNA is a huge uh, area of study. We just had also one major study, which, uh, you know, uh, had come out and was discussed in science and all that. And uh, I'm sure, but I think for the Todas, they haven't actually had any uh, DNA work done so far. I don't think so. Mm. Yeah. Definitely an important kind of so, thing to do. And, and I must say, I actually came in contact with some Brahmi speakers. And that's when I got really surprised that there was so much of similarities, which, which we didn't realize in, in, you know, some of the words and everything. It's so different from Tamil. Yeah, yeah. Which one is this? Yeah. Toda language, actually, it is very um, different. But you find that there are some... Um, you know, uh, uh, connections which, like for instance, uh, the Yeruma, the bull, they have some word that sounds a bit similar, air or something, but they, the way they pronounce it, it's only when you really think about it, you realize, ah, yes, this has actually come from, or rather similar to Yeruma, but it just sounds very different after they have, you know, it's gone through its own kind of uh, alterations and that kind of thing. So, um, and that's what also the, one of the, uh, the only person who speaks to that, Tarun Chabra, also feels that when you, break it up, there is, you do see the connections with some of the uh, Dravidian sounding words as well. But so, of course, a lot of their words are different, there's no doubt. No. So let's thank uh, Sharda for a wonderful talk and present her with a memento. Thank you so much. So kind of you. Know.